Welcome to our leadership journey. We are Mike Cloutier and Peter Januszewski, and our goal is to interview people leaders at different stages of their career, from frontline managers to CEOs, and extract the leadership lessons they've learned on their journey to help you become a better leader. On this episode, we had the honor of speaking with Teresa Firestone. Over her impressive career, Teresa has held senior executive positions in Canada, Europe, and Asia across various sectors, including retail, healthcare, and government. She has more than two decades of board experience and currently sits on the boards of a number of biotech companies, as well as the Board of Governors of the University of Guelph. Prior to her recent retirement, Teresa was Senior Vice President at Shoppers Drug Mart. Teresa has received numerous awards and recognitions, including the prestigious Queen's Golden Jubilee Medal and an induction into the Canadian Healthcare Marketing Hall of Fame. In our discussion, we cover adjusting your leadership style when working in different geographies and cultures, socializing ideas within an organization, and the utility of skip-level meetings. Teresa, welcome. Uh, we're thrilled to have you here with us this evening and uh, very much looking forward to a great conversation about a subject that I know is near and dear to you, as it is to Peter and I, and that is leadership. And in particular, uh, we're exploring people's leadership journey. And I'll begin by uh, saying that I've uh, been really uh, quite fortunate to know you for a, a rather significant part of my career in a variety of different roles. Uh, at the very beginning, uh, across the desk, so to speak, and trying to uh, manage some uh, products onto the Ontario Drug Benefit Formulary, and then sort of side by side in industry, and then working very closely together on uh, the Maris board. But um, what I'd uh, what I'd really appreciate is because your background is so diverse, and you've had an opportunity to be involved in leadership roles uh, in, you know, in government, in Canada, in Europe, uh, you've been in leadership positions relative to boards. So what we thought we would do is just start by uh, having you tell us a little bit about your journey, the roles you've had, um, and, uh, how leadership has been uh, a big part of that. And, uh, so with that, welcome. Thank you. And, uh, thanks for inviting me. So the journey, um, and as you know, I've just recently retired, so I'm kind of at the end of a portion of the journey. I don't say I'm at the, the real end. Um, well, I had the, the good fortune early in my career to work uh, for the Ontario government, and I very early on, I was able to take on some very interesting leadership roles at a, actually a pretty young age, um, a very young age. I had responsibility for uh, 8,000 staff, 3,000 patients, and a uh, pretty significant budget. And I was running the psychiatric hospitals. So I, I learned a couple of things there. I learned managing from a distance because they were all over the province. And I learned how to work in a unionized environment. Um, the people who reported to me, which at that time, the hospitals were owned and operated by the province. So I had 10 hospital administrators, mostly men, mostly old enough to be my father. Um, many of them who treated me um, like a daughter. Um, so I, I kind of had to learn pretty quickly how to manage in that environment. Um, and I moved from there at a couple of short stops along the way, but I ended up uh, with uh, Pfizer and had uh, really some great opportunities there because um, first I was the first woman to join the leadership team. Um, and that seemed to be a big deal because there weren't very many women moving up um, to leadership roles. Um, but I, I had an opportunity to, to do some really interesting things. So move from government affairs to a sales role, um, having never done sales. And then, of course, you needed to have either sales or marketing to be able to do uh, general management. And uh, like you, Mike, I moved to a number of general management roles. So a VP of sales, um, again, some pretty large um, groups. So I had about 1,000 staff in that role. And then... Um, had an opportunity to move uh, to Europe to be country manager in a completely different environment, uh, but country manager in Austria, having never uh, been to the country before moving there and taking the role, and then then back to Canada, general manager role, and then uh, the last role with Pfizer was as regional president in Asia, um, responsible for 13, 13 markets, uh, 15 countries. And so 
in again in an environment that was very different. Um, so I guess kind of the the core, if you will, or the things that kind of supported me along the way were the different skill sets because I didn't know the environments, I didn't know the businesses in those countries. But what I was able to bring is kind of that overall general management skill set. And the, I guess, yes, you know, in retrospect, the, the leadership skills that are kind of built along the way. Right. So I, I, I love that you just uh, went into that international experience. This is one of my further questions in, in this list that I have for you was actually on this topic. So we'll go there now because you just took us there, which is wonderful. So when you're moving around from country to country, you're having these international experiences. You mentioned you brought along this toolkit of leadership skills that you've acquired. But did anything surprise you when you moved to Austria and you were in Shanghai or in Hong Kong? Was there a leadership style that was maybe more preferred? Did you have to sort of turn down or up some dials of your leadership style to, to fit the new location and the new culture? There are definitely cultural differences. Um, I, I think kind of the first thing that surprised me um, that I hadn't really thought through because, you know, in North America or uh, in Canada, um, I think if you're comfortable with your team, they'll challenge you. And I, I had a couple of scenarios when I went to Austria where people wouldn't challenge. And I mean, on really basic things. And kind of a funny story was we had a leadership team meeting every Tuesday morning at eight o'clock. And every Tuesday morning, they were running in last minute late. It was a mad scramble for coffee. And, and after like five or six meetings, took me a while. I said, why is everybody always late? are always in a rush. And they said, well, because we can only drop our kids off at school at like 10 to 8, and then it's a mad rush to get here. And I said, well, why don't we have the meeting at 9 or 10 or like whatever? And, and they said, we didn't know we could ask that. So change the time. They were like, oh, even 8.15 is fine. And, and I, it kind of started me thinking like, I need to ask more questions um, because things that I just assumed, like people in Canada would have said, you know, like, we need we can't start at eight because we have to take our kids they didn't know me they weren't comfortable mm -hmm. and i think the culture there is somewhat more let's say a little more rigid and so what i realized is i wasn't necessarily going to change everything but i needed to ask more and i needed to explore more than i might have elsewhere and it was a tiny little thing but they were so happy <laughs> And then, you know, we made it, I don't know, nine o'clock and people were like just so much more, um, they were prepared, they got to the meeting on time, they got there early. And, and it made me think that, you know, sometimes you can do really small things and make a big difference for people. That's, that's a great example. And so I, I was born in, uh, in Poland. So that sort of Eastern Europe mentality of respect for authority there's that like that that's you know my, when my parents hear me talk about certain things or like challenging a physician like that's something you just do not do right like you whatever the physician says whatever the director of your company your boss says that's that's gospel and you got to follow in line so I, I i can see where that would come from that's a wonderful example so Teresa, i want to uh, just dive into this just a little bit more as you were speaking i couldn't help but think about the value of listening and inquiry and your example kind of spoke to that but um what about in situations where you're already kind of in the cultural norm you're already you have some already thinking about what leadership's supposed to be about say in your prior experiences in north america or when you returned back to north america and in different roles how did that example or that time influence your ability to consider the importance of listening yeah, so, you know, coming back to North America, so I came back twice, once when I went back to Pfizer, uh, Canada, and then when I came back the last time, uh, I joined Shoppers. And I guess what it, I guess sort of all those collective experiences each time I moved to a new role, um, what it, it kind of allowed me to do was kind of, you kind of keep building, right? Because you have different experiences and kind of hard to explain, but I guess I kind of thought through scenarios a little more, um, especially entering into a new role. And, and I thought through kind of how I was being perceived, what, what the expectations were, and just trying to build the team a little more. Whereas earlier in my career, it was just like go in, do the job, and not really think about it so much. So I guess 
you know, as I progressed in my career and particularly towards the last 10 years, I guess I was just much more thoughtful about kind of how do you actually approach a new scenario? And, and I think, you know, it, it's so easy because we're always in such a rush and we have so much to do and you're onboarding and there's so much to learn that you kind of forget to stop and think and actually talk to people and, and ask them. And I remember even when I was in uh, Austria, it was kind of the first, first time I really made a really diligent effort to kind of make sure that I got feedback from everybody. And I remember I asked one person, uh, um, was the head of uh, finance at the time, um, you know, what's the feedback? How, like, how is this going? And he said, you're moving way too fast for us. Like, we can't keep this pace. And I was thinking, well, I haven't even started. And I was like... <laughs> You know, like I was going slow on purpose, and, but, it, but asking for the feedback and stopping and having that conversation was actually really telling because I, re- I thought we were going off by a little bit and I was about to ramp up like crazy. And then I realized we were actually miles apart because he thought I was already going too fast and I thought I was going, you know, mm-hmm. super slow. So I, I think, you know, asking more questions, asking people for feedback, asking them like, is this working for you? Are you getting enough time? Are you, you know, am I moving too fast? I mean, if, if I am, like, maybe it's not the right fit for them. But, you know, taking the time to do that, checking in much more, mm-hmm. um, I would say was something that I kind of got better at as the years went by. Teresa, I, um, I, I watched the, uh, the, there's a little clip on YouTube of you um, accepting uh, your induction into the Canadian Healthcare Marketing Hall of Fame. And in the speech leading up to you coming onto the stage, um, John Hello says um, that, in reference to you, says the word impossible does not exist in her vocabulary. I was wondering if you'd share with us why that perception of you exists and maybe some examples. A couple of examples. Well, when I, for, I'm giving an example where somebody told me I couldn't do something. When I first uh, joined Pfizer, um, there was a product called Aricept for, it was the first product for Alzheimer's and it hadn't been listed. And I had previously run the drug program and it was my job to get it listed. It was listed anywhere in the country. And the VP of sales and marketing at the time said to me, you will never do it. I <laughs> said this on my first day. We were at a meeting in Vancouver launching another product and he said, I just want to tell you my opinion is it's not, never going to happen. And I don't care what your background is, you're never going to do it. Anyhow, that was January 4th. In May, I got it listed in Ontario. And in July, I got it listed in Quebec. And so, you know, for me, it's like, I like the challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I can see the goal. I want to go after it. I'm pretty driven. But I also, you know, I, I, I think, you know, the reason that I've had an opportunity to be successful in some of those things is because we, I do it as a team. And for me... Um, bringing the team along to get there with you and having the whole team accountable. Um, you know, I like to kind of look at that I'll be accountable if we fail and if we're successful, then it's the whole team. Right. That's perfect. Thank you. Uh, the, the other thing that I caught from that video, which is a, a wonderful quote from you, when you came up to, to accept the, the recognition, um, you were talking about... Um, the tendency to look back within the industry at the past as the good old days, right? There's, there's some mention of that. And you said your suggestion was um, that in another five to 10 years, these will be the good old days. And I think this is 2010 when this award was, was being received. And then you said, so I suggest we enjoy them while we have them. So we are now exactly 10, 11 years from the time you gave that speech. <laughs> Do you think we're now looking back at 2010? And this is a very industry specific question, obviously. But do you think we're looking back at 2010 thinking, oh, there was things, times were so much better back then? Yeah, I think so. Um, because what happened is there were, there were several presentations before the one that you saw, and, and everyone thought it was so great. But at the time, they thought it was hell. Um, and they were complaining. I mean, they were talking when I was running the drug program, and the, the folks that were at the meeting were were on the industry side complaining that I wasn't listing products or things weren't happening or weren't going fast enough. And then in comparison, 2010, like I said, looked pretty good. If you look at 2010 versus today in the industry, I mean, the requirements and the, you know, the things that you need to do to get a product available in Canada or that you need to do to get something available in pharmacy 
it's it's terrible. I mean, not even taking COVID into consideration. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think that everyone kind of looks back and thinks it was great. At the time, it didn't always feel so great. And and today is like the good old days of the future. Maybe not the last year and a half, but <laughs> yeah. When I think about leadership, and I, I talk about it, but I just think it's so important is that it, 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 it's really hard work. <laughs> And I don't mean that to say that, you know, I had a tough time doing it. I'm just saying it takes hard work because um, it, it's not just about taking courses and, you know, whatever. It, it's it's really about spending time with people, understanding people, listening. Um, and and as I said earlier, you can't turn it on and turn it off. You, it, it's, it's something that has to be constant. And then I guess the other piece, um, which we didn't really cover, is like being open to feedback and criticism. Um, uh, particularly from people that report to you and, and being comfortable and allowing people comfortable environment to be able to do that because, you know, very often you just get kind of the cursory, oh, yeah, everything's great because um, they don't want to criticize their boss. But if you can get to the point where people give you, as, as the direct reports, if they can give you really honest, sincere feedback of how to make you a better leader, um, to me, that's 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 the best that you're ever going to get. It's just hard to get people to feel comfortable to do it and create a safe enough environment so that they really give you the honest feedback. So, Teresa, any tips and tricks? Because I I am currently living this, and and I I love feedback. I I'm, I'm with you. I mean, it's the only way I'm getting, going to grow. And who's who knows my blind spots better than the people that report into me and that see me on a daily basis and see me failing in probably a number of ways that I'm just totally blind to. So how do you how do you encourage them to give you that feedback? How do you make that safe environment happen? Well, so one thing I I do is I do a lot of skip level meetings. Um, so I meet with the next level mm. down. Um, sometimes two levels, but certainly next level down. Probably I don't know two three times a year. Um, and so people not everybody by the way is comfortable with that. Some people want to be there for those meetings. Um, but if you can get people comfortable there, um, and then you know you may get information back from them that mm-hmm. can help you understand your manager from a different in a different way. Because it also you'll get you often get really good feedback. So you can also share p- positive things from them that are not coming from you, but coming from other people. Mm-hmm. And it, it it kind of helps round it out a little bit. You're having a dialogue that's a little more fulsome, and so. There's good. There's not so good, um, and it, and and then you say like I, I want to have the same feedback, right? So, I I think by by being open yourself and by kind of collecting data from a lot of different points, mm-hmm. and and doing it informally, um, so it's not like you're formally sitting across when you're doing the performance appraisal and they know you're going to meet them and saying so can I have the feedback? Um, you know, you do it at another time of year or multiple times in the year and ask like like. Did you get enough support on on the last issue that we went through? Like, I know it was really tough. What could I have done differently to support you? And you can get some pretty interesting feedback. I mean, some people will give you the pat answers, but some people will will start to share. Mm -hmm. And I think also asking for feedback from your manager, critical feedback, Mm -hmm. not just saying, you know, oh, how did I do this year? And I hope you got a good rating, but saying like, Give me examples of like if you were in my job when that happened, what would you have done differently? You know, because the, the goal is really to learn and to get multiple experiences so that the next time something comes up, you've got a little more depth and and can manage a bit. I really like your point on the the coaching, the scenario coaching. I think that that's brilliant. So like that's something I'm personally going to take with me moving forward. That that's. That's a very, very great, good idea. So thank you for sharing that, Teresa. Uh, I have one question that popped in my head as you were talking. Any advice that you've received throughout the years that you thought, oh, that's terrible? Um, I don't know if it's advice necessarily or things I've heard that really bug me. Um, one of the things that really bugs me is when people say, oh, they'll get over it. They just need time. Mm. You know, like they had a bad experience. They'll get over it. They'll be fine the next time. For me, it's like, 
when when people do that, um, it it really is not giving the person the attention. Um, and, and I've had this happen a few times where someone doesn't get a job and someone else, you know, didn't do, like something didn't go well. And, oh yeah, they'll get over it. Like don't worry about mm. them, you know. And I, for me, I think there's a tendency to do that a little too much. Like we we kind of next we'll move on to the next issue. And I think taking the time, going back, spending spending time with the person, sharing with them, you know, feedback. And then helping them understand, like maybe they'll never get a job at the next yeah. level, um, and and being honest, but like taking time in a very measured way over a period of time. Um, but I have had feedback where people said, "Oh, don't stop worrying about them. Like you know, they'll get over it." And I just I don't think it's I don't think we do anyone justice when we do that because maybe they'll never get over it. Um, and so I think providing more support to people because everybody needs a different kind of support and not kind of treating everybody the same way. Teresa, if, if we go back to the the beginning where you, you said you, 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 when you started managing teams, it was very, very quickly, a very large team of people. When you were first put into that leadership position, what are some leadership traits that you felt like came fairly naturally to you? And what are those other ones that you felt like you really had to very deliberately try to add to your repertoire? I would say um, being courageous, making tough decisions, um, not hesitating to you know take risks. I think the the thing you know I had to do over from then, um, which took me a long time to get out of my my response to that to you know to the scenario that I explained um, was that I I kind of got tough, mm. and so that was how I coped with it because you know. I, I did a couple of things. One is I got tough, but I also learned the business in a really detailed way. Sometimes I think I knew the business better than the people that I was managing, which shouldn't really be the case, right? Because they, at the next level down, they, they would know their business better than than the leader. Um, but I, I, I used that as kind of the crutch. And then I also was tough. And I, I realized it took me a long time to get out of that because after I didn't have that scenario with people and still tough. And so um, it was probably the lesson, you know, like I said, if it was a do-over, I would have been more approachable. I think you can be tough and approachable at the same time. Um, probably wasn't as approachable. Um, so I, I think, but I, I think probably, you know, being courageous, not hesitating to, to kind of be strong, take risks, even in an area I maybe didn't know so much. Um, I made sure that I was very knowledgeable um, and then, you know, joint, what I would call joint, I talked about it earlier, joint accountability, mm. where if there's tough decisions, we're going to make them together and, and everybody's going to be accountable. And it's actually, you know, there's a story on, on that, which, um, you know, I kind of, I like to share because in the end it was a success. Um, at the beginning, I didn't think it was going to be when, when I, um, when I first moved to Asia, um, I was working for Pfizer, had, you know, the usual round of cuts to make. And I, the first round of cuts I made before I, uh, before I actually moved there, so those were mostly on the phone, um, making tough decisions. And then we had another round, um, you know, the usual restructuring, whatever. And I asked um, two of my leaders, um, who are country managers, to lead a team to do some restructuring and provide recommendations because I didn't really know the region, didn't know the countries, and I thought there'd be better accountability if they owned it. And one of them called me after I proposed it and said, I don't want to do this, which was very surprising because it's not sort of natural in the Asian culture to kind of challenge and say no. Um, and he said, I don't think we should do this. I, I don't really want to lead this group. And I said, you can have whoever you want on the team to support you. Um, but I need you to look, you know, develop a series of recommendations of how we should do it. And anyhow, I really didn't give him the choice that he had to do it. And this were the reasons why, because I wanted them to own it. And I also knew that if it came from one of the senior people in the team and with input from, from many countries, that there was a better chance it would be successful. And he was very unhappy and he, and he didn't really have a choice. 
And when it was over, they came back with a series of recommendations. They were tough because we were making tough changes, um, but we implemented them. And he called me back after and he said, you know, I really didn't want to do it. And I said, yeah, I had the message. And he said, but I'm actually really glad you, I think he used the term forced me to do it, um, because I learned a lot and I now understand what you were after that you wanted us to own it. And I thought, you know, I was really pleased that he actually made the call back because so often people don't come back and tell you, oh, you know, and you actually made the right decision. But it was it was really tough for me for those two or three months because I was getting, you know, kind of weekly updates from the, from the committee and I knew that he didn't really want to do it. And it wasn't really the support there. But I, you know, hung tough. And in the end, there was joint accountability. Mm -hmm. and And everybody because we had people from different departments. Everybody owned the recommendation. Nobody liked them, mm. but everybody owned it. And I think it was a much better uh, result, ultimately. Brilliant. So it, when you go back over your career, you obviously manage teams in different countries and different <laughs> industries. Um, if, if you were to have an ideal description of you as a leader that would be provided by the people that have worked with you for you over the years, what would you hope they would all say about your leadership? Um, I would like them to say I was fair. I was supportive. I was courageous in the decisions that I made. Uh, made. Um, that I was comfortable with risk. Uh, and I say that because I, I think that Good leaders need to be comfortable with risks. Um, and I guess, you know, I, I don't know that they would say kind because I said I kind of figured that out later. Um, but um, I would say they would probably say very supportive. I mean, I was saying, you know, just gone through retirement. I've heard from a lot of people that um, I supported over the years. Um, and I, I think the other thing they would probably say is that I really supported career development. Um, and spent a fair bit of time helping people understand what their path would be. And, and I feel kind of good about that because people tried to help me, but it wasn't, um, you know, um, many, many years ago when I started, it wasn't kind of the normal path. People didn't sit down and, you know, do development plans the same way as they do today. And they, you know, you didn't have 360s and people didn't say, you know, here's what you should be going after. You know, a lot of things just kind of fell into place, but there wasn't the same kind of planning. So, Teresa, my experience in working beside you is seeing what you describe <laughs> as the toughness relative to the business issues. But I also have had the experience of seeing the humane um, side of you, the humanity of understanding that people part of the issue that we're working on. And uh, uh, you've kind of spoken to that in a way, but described it through your own vernacular. T can you talk a little bit about your experience with sort of situational leadership, but ad adapting your leadership style to the situation and ensuring that the result you're seeking will be there? Yeah, I think, um, and, and I think this is where having worked in different environments and with different cultures, I think that was really helpful for me, certainly in the last 10 years, is I come back to listening, um, listening and, and reading body language, which of course was a little bit more challenging um, <laughs> in the last year and a half. But I think really listening to what people are saying, and I, and I say listening not, because there's kind of two kinds of listening, listening to decide what you're going to say next, right? So like, listening to, to they finish so that you can make your statement, or there's really listening to understand. And, you know, I would say that the listening to understand is, is probably the best thing you can do in terms of adapting to an environment. Um, so part of it's body language, partly it's trying to really understand what people are saying, or like they don't agree with you because they don't understand you, or they don't agree with you because they don't like your idea, um, or, or they have a better idea. Um, so I, I think really kind of paying attention to what's going on in a room. The other, the other piece I, I think that you know has served me well is is what I call socializing in advance. 
and that is socializing ideas so that, you know, if you want to do something different, something that involves risk or something that's tough, even sometimes good things, people react because they, different people take different amounts of time to digest things. And some people are really fast, you come up with an idea and they go, wow, that's a great idea, let's, let's go with it. And other people need like a week to digest. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, everybody's different. So I think, you know, um, socializing a lot of things in advance, mm -hmm. it's basically preparing table, right? So that when you get there, and I don't mean so you get there, it's a rubber stamp, but people don't have confusion about an idea or what you want to do. Um, so for me, back to your question about situational leadership, for me, it's like listening, being able to adjust, and also having a certain level of flexibility because, you know, maybe I have a, a great idea, but maybe with the input of everybody else, it could actually be a, a much better idea. And so, you know, a certain amount of flexibility doesn't have to be your way or your idea, as long as like you're all moving forward. Teresa, you mentioned um, mentorship. Uh, and, and the importance of, of that and how much, how much um, pleasure, joy you've derived from, from helping others sort of help uh, sort their direction and pave their way. I know that you took an executive uh, leadership course from Harvard. So I, I want to know, in the advice that you give to others, where do you fall on like formalized leadership training versus training by actually doing the role? Or is there a combination of both? Um, well, first, I don't think people are born leaders. I've never thought that. I think leadership is really hard work. And it's, you can't sort of say, well, I'll be a leader on Tuesday and Wednesday, I'm like, just gonna be whatever. It's hard work. It's every day. It's all day long. Um, and you have to work at it. Um, so You know how much of it can I, I think a big part of it is you learn as you go but you know the problem is you need to help people before they get into a position of mm. senior leadership so i think there's ways to help people long before they're they're in the leadership position like in other words you can't wait till you're managing people to learn how to lead so then it's tough well like how do i get there right you never manage people so um if there's that juggling thing right um I think there's a lot of things that we do just in every day and how we work with our peers that also demonstrate leadership. So you don't actually have to be leading people to be become a leader. You know, the things that we just talked about and that Mikey just kind of reinforced, like the act of listening, um, the how you respond to to ideas, how quickly you move, how action oriented you are, how you treat people, are you kind, are you responsive, all those things are parts of leadership that you can um, do in a non-leadership position, right? Um, because you don't magically wake up one day, get a bunch of people reporting to you and become a star. Like it, 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 it's, I think you have to work at it. And, and I, you know, I've thought about it many times, like the times I, I think things didn't go as well as when I didn't work at it very hard. This is a very exciting part of the program, Teresa, where we have a series of rapid fire questions that Peter leads, and it's been remarkably fun so far. So uh, Peter's going to take you on the next part of our, our leadership podcast journey. <laughs> take it away, Peter. Hey. Thank you. Okay, Teresa. So number one, if someone were to write a biography of your professional journey to date, what would be the title? Um, what would be the title? <laughs> Um, I would say driven to the end, but <laughs> she was tough but fair. If your book was turned into a production, and but they were looking through history to find a character, either fiction mm. or nonfiction, who would the fiction or nonfiction character be to play oh. the lead? Um, well, one of the things that I read a lot is, his, uh, mostly, almost entirely, is historical fiction. And I have been reading a lot of books um, about World War II and mostly written by women and about women who were spies or working in the resistance. So one of them, because they are, there's some really amazing stories. Very interesting. 
if you were going to write the theme song or an anthem for leadership, what would be the chorus line that would be repeated throughout the song? Something that you think leaders really should be thinking about. Oh, well, I kind of thought of a song, which is a song I've often Perfect. Said, that I would like to um, have played. I actually like had it played at meetings, which is You Can Get It If You Really Want by Jimmy Cliff. Mm. And because if you listen to the words in the song, it basically says, try, try, try harder, try again. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, if, if you want something, there's, it comes back to what I said earlier, there's hard work, you have to really try, and you have to be dedicated to, and driven to get it. Excellent. Excellent. That's great. Um, okay, so books. So this is great. Um, what books have you most gifted to new employees, members of your team? So you mentioned you read novels, lots, lots of fiction, but in the maybe there's some nonfiction uh, books that you you've handed off to, to to some colleagues or. Yeah, unfortunately, I wasn't very creative. I mostly gave them the first ninety days. Um, oh, that's, that's not so funny. Yeah, I, I'm I'm doing um, the same but, thing. <laughs> but you know what? There's two other books that I think I wish I'd given people. Um, both by Malcolm Gladwell. Um, so one is Blink, mm -hmm. and the other is The Tipping Point. Um, because both of the, first of all, because they're really interesting to read, um, but they're also really enlightening because you can really sort of see yourself and see scenarios. When I talked earlier about like finding scenarios where you had to make a decision or something happened, um, I think those, I mean, 90 day, I gave it or I recommended it many times. The reality is you can get the, the short version on the, online. Yeah. But those two books, I think, are really valuable for people to read. And, and there are other, I mean, he has other ones as well, but those mm -hmm. two in particular, because they talk a lot about kind of how things can turn in your favor or not. Um, and then also how people make decisions, you know, like really in the blink of an eye and, and sometimes like massive decisions. Some good, some not so good. Yeah. Where can people find you if they want to connect with you, if they want to follow you in your, your career journey from this point forward? Where can they find you? Um, probably best is LinkedIn. Perfect. Um, I'm, I'm pretty regular. I don't necessarily post a lot, but I certainly do follow and follow a lot of folks. So, yeah, that's the best, best way to get me. Wonderful. So we'll definitely uh, link that in the show notes. Um, thank you very much for the time, Teresa. This is wonderful. Uh, thanks yeah. for the discussion. It was great. Thanks for being available. Really appreciate it.